Again, good morning everyone. It's uh, nice uh, to see you at our conference. It's especially pleasant to see so many of you coming here this year, since many of you were missing, really missing some big events from the Python team for a few years maybe. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to hear uh, to see you here and uh, we are starting our conference and uh, the first uh, session of this day is my session about uh, the Firebird and its current development status. What we are doing now, what we are going to support and what are our uh, future plans and how uh, you may affect our future plans, how you may be involved <coughs> in our planning. Uh, of course, you know that uh, 5.4 is approaching its release time, but anyway, we still hear 5.3 uh, in development and uh, fixing some bugs there. And uh, we also uh, had for 5.2.5, which actually, uh, may still be used by some of you. Uh, not, I know that not everyone was, was migrated to 5.3 and that's <coughs> quite okay. Uh, but 5.2.5, uh, uh, the point is that uh, it's going to be discontinued. We have recently uh, made available the last point release with uh, quite a number of bug fixes and a few min minor improvements in the 5.2.5 series. Uh, it was released in June this year. Uh, maybe you had already upgraded, maybe not. Uh, but our yeah. policy, our release policy, and that we deprecate uh, all the versions after two major versions are released. For example, we now have now 5.3. When 5.4 is released, 5.2.5 is no longer supported. Uh, so we already call it discontinued because it's very unlikely to be any of uh, the 10 point release for example but but some bugs that you consider important enough and we are aware of that you report them are being fixed in the code base and they are included in the snapshot build so actually well officially discontinued we do not make any new packages but uh, if you have any problems with the release if you, uh, if you uh, want to keep uh, 5.2.5 running for a year, maybe or two years more, uh, you should uh, just check uh, the snapshot build, uh, check what build, uh, what uh, bugs in the trigger, uh, what fixed after the 5.2.5.9 uh, <coughs> release, so you could benefit from this bug fixes. And of course, 5.3 is still uh, the major part of the in production. Uh, for those who had migrated to 5.3, of course, but uh, I see many of my, and uh, more and more people finally upgrading and uh, migrating to 5.3. Uh, we had uh, 5.3.0.4 released uh, one year ago, uh, and uh, actually we uh, wish to release the next one, release 3.0.5 uh, in the middle of this year, but it was a little bit delayed, so it's expected quite soon after the conference now. Uh, it contains mostly bus fixes, but many bus fixes, uh, and uh, some of them are quite important. And uh, we also uh, try to improve uh, the engine in some areas, in the multi-threading and scalability in performance in the optimizer area and so on. So uh, 5.3 still gets some uh, improvements <coughs> and every uh, version has some uh, performance and optimizer improvements and so on. And 5.3.5, uh, 3.0.5 with also is also uh, will be released with uh, many improvements. Not many. You can see six, but uh, still they exist. 5.3 will be maintained until 5.5 is out. The same early plan is applied to uh, two major versions. Uh, so actually it means <coughs> that it will be active uh, and uh, in active bug fixing and actively supported for maybe at least two years more. Uh, so uh, that's about 5.3. Uh, the next part of my presentation is uh, dedicated to 5.4. What we had already released in the uh, Alpha and Beta build, so what uh, we are doing now, uh, and what uh, should be available and when. Uh, and what actually are the major features of 5.4? Uh, you know that we will have uh, many talks in this uh, conference. Uh, 
dedicated to black looking features as part of four. So I will not be describe them in details right now because you will see the special sessions about them. Uh, but the other features I will uh, just make some overview how they are done, how it works and why. Uh, I got uh, four Alpha One release uh, has introduced many uh, features. Actually, it's a new major old It's Actually, uh, it's a longer metadata name. Uh, it's bound to the uh, new ODS, of course, so the feature cannot be made uh, available be uh, without that. Uh, we have introduced a bigger page size uh, for really a huge databases, may benefit from that. Uh, ability to perform incremental backup restore uh, via and backup. Incremental backup is available, but now uh, incremental restore is also available. Uh, we have introduced uh, some special uh, DBA permissions predefined and uh, some special system roles. Uh, we have uh, developed the feature of the timeout time feature. Uh, so it can be applied to the idle statement, uh, long running uh, statement and uh, idle connection. Uh, an ability to grant roles to another role to aggregate the permissions and so on. Uh, actually, just a short list, you may check the release notes. Uh, Alpha 1 release this, uh, was available more than a year ago. So actually, these features are quite old already, and you could uh, test them and uh, report any bugs, if any, and so on. It's not, uh, a little bit more interesting is what uh, was introduced more recently. Just a moment, guys. Oh, microphone. <coughs> Hello? Uh-huh. Is it any better? No? I don't think so. Ah, I shouldn't speak really close, but it's not comfortable. Okay, I hope it will not go away from me. Okay, <coughs> uh, Fiber Beta 1 uh, has also introduced uh, some new features, uh, and they are maybe uh, also important for you. Uh, just again, a short list is here. And this is exactly the features we will be talking about at this conference, and in uh, particular, some of them will be uh, described in my uh, session. Uh, we have introduced, uh, finally, uh, committed, uh, we committed implementation of the built-in logical application. Uh, we have introduced a new uh, read consistency mode for uh, read committed transactions, and uh, some uh, new improvements in the garbage collection uh, was also implemented. Uh, well, uh, developing this feature. Uh, we have introduced uh, new data types, uh, type zone support, uh, deck whole data type improvements in the numeric uh, data types, and so on. Uh, we have added a few built in uh, functions uh, related to the cryptographical uh, features. Uh, and uh, we have introduced, uh, finally, to back now support the encrypted database, so you can uh, perform a uh, backup of uh, S4 encrypted databases. And uh, we have implemented a, po a pooling of external connections. Uh, by external, I mean here are connections to other databases performed with an execute statement on external feature. Uh, so that uh, to reduce the overhead uh, of uh, multiple connections and so on. This is just a short list, of course. Uh, we will be uh, explaining them with detail. But uh, what actually we were doing this uh, particular year? Because beta 1 was released in February, uh, so actually some of the half, half of the year has passed. Many bugs were fixed since that release. Uh, and uh, right now, I don't remember any uh, big uh, problems uh, with new features that we are aware of. So uh, we consider that the code base becomes pretty stable. And uh, we are getting closer to the final release. But also, a few more new features and improvements were added uh, after beta 1 release, but they are not uh, maybe so important and big uh, as, the, as the ones I described previously. In here, uh, as you can see here. 
Uh, what are the most interesting of them? It's an ability to share uh, the database snapshot state, transaction snapshot state between different uh, transactions, snapshot transactions. Uh, again, uh, some new uh, built-in functions were added. Uh, we have implemented uh, the feature called as lateral derived tables. It's an ability to join uh, to a subquery derived table, but uh, with uh, internal references to the other streams. Uh, and, we, and we have added to the recreate user statement. Not uh, actually big features, but uh, something new that you may test in snapshot build. However, a few features required uh, some attention uh, from our team. Uh, features that were already implemented and uh, offered in beta one or a little bit <coughs> later. Uh, and uh, this uh, what we were discussing and uh, but are recording recently. Uh, you know that Firebird uh, 4 has introduced a new decoy data, uh, data type, and uh, we have also uh, supported longer numeric condensable data types based on that, internally based on that decoy uh, data type internal. It was just a logical step, it worked good, but the problem is that uh, it worked quite slowly. Uh, and uh, it's not really maybe important if you just uh, add one integer to another integer, yes, one numeric to another numeric. Uh, but uh, when you have aggregation, or when you have complex computations with intermediate co calculations, uh, the speed becomes important, and uh, actually the overhead of the using Techloid data type uh, was quite uh, annoying for us, and uh, we tried to consider different alternatives and finally uh, chosen to implement a native uh, integer data type uh, which is longer than begin, which is, you know, it's, uh, 64 bits. The new data type is twice as bigger. Uh, it's supported by some compilers natively, uh, so the speed is really uh, better than DEC4. Uh, so we have implemented this data type internally, and uh, we have uh, changed the implementation of long uh, numeric and decimal data types to use a new or uh, internal data type, integer data type. Uh, also, we are considering to add, uh, actually not add, uh, you know, Firebird 4 introduce uh, data, new, uh, new data types, deck code, and uh, time with time zone. All the applications and the connectivity libraries know nothing about these data types. Of course, if you develop new application and want to use these features, it's okay for you to wait until uh, your connectivity library developers catch up and uh, implement the support in uh, the library, the upgrade, and uh, release a new version of your client application, and so on. Uh, but uh, sometimes you may want to use the features inside the database earlier but your client application is not ready to deal with these data types. How you should uh, do, what connectivity and actually what compatibility options uh, are possible for you because just if you use a unknown data type, you, any uh, private client library will just throw error, unknown data type, and that's all. You cannot work with that at all. Uh, in beta one, we offered actually uh, some kind of uh, compatibility binding options, so that new data types on the server side may be described as different, already known for you data types on the client side. For example, that load is actually an uh, exact representation of the floating point number. Client library, uh, all the client library and all the connectivity library may not support it, but they uh, do support, for example, double precision. Of course, it was available for well, uh, 20 years and um, even more in the interface. Uh, so uh, you may run a special statement that been for uh, that call to uh, double precision, for example, and uh, work around these new data types and still being able to use in your client application. Of course, with some consequences because you know that the data, uh, that call data type is exact, double precision is not so exact, uh, but anyway, you can use it. Or you may just uh, force the engine to cast this uh, value to the string and deal it with the string on the client side. It's also a, a, a option for you. And the same option uh, were added for the time zone support. If you don't, don't know how to deal with uh, date time values, uh, including time zone and region information, uh, you may force the engine to cast it 
to the time uh, and same span without time zone because uh, all applications support that or to string. Again, a separate option was, a uh, separate statement was implemented for that. But uh, recently we had an idea to uh, just replace these two uh, statements and maybe more statements in the future, we will introduce more data types in the future. With just a single comment, flexible enough to just map any data type to another data type. Uh, and we are currently uh, we're discussing that in the deal uh, list, and it could be uh, implemented before the final release. Also, uh, when uh, the new uh, risk consistency mode for recommitted transactions were implemented, as a part of that feature, we have implemented a uh, so no, uh, thing as query risk part. So if uh, some statement uh, encounters some conflict, update conflict with update transaction, uh, so far, the firebird, what it did, it just aborted with error. After timeout, or immediately, depending on your transaction option. Uh, that is, could be good, but for a committed transaction, there's maybe a really small gap and the concurrent transaction is committed, and you may retry without problems, without conflict. But you already <laughs> have an error, the client side is responding to that, uh, rollback transaction maybe, and so on. Uh, so, uh, we have implemented the ability internally inside the engine to restart the current part of the query after the discovering conflict if uh, the concrete transaction has been committed. We detect that and retry internally. So that a user can just uh, see a uh, much less update conflict under the big load. Uh, it worked, but we were not really satisfied with the result achieved. Uh, and we were trying uh, different ideas how to work around, how to implement uh, it better, and uh, now we have both an idea and the patch uh, that does it better. It just uh, hasn't been committed in the, in the code base yet, but probably it will be before the final release. Again, we have introduced time with time zone. That's good. Many of you uh, wanted that. Uh, some of the, you may consider using it. Uh, but the problem, the part of the problem, uh, is that the client side now requires the ITU library to deal with the region names the time zone. If you don't use the feature, this uh, dependency is uh, was optional. But if you do use it, uh, it becomes a problem for some of you. Uh, right now we have a patch in the code base committed into the code base that quite uh, implement some workaround about that. It converts the region names to the GMT time and so on. Uh, but uh, we are considering something uh, different, uh, maybe uh, more flexible for the client application to again uh, specify how do they want to deal with the time zones and region names on the client side. Do they uh, do you really need to get it as is, as private reports, or do you want uh, do you prefer to deal but just with the regional type, such as uh, your local uh, computer, your local uh, host has, uh, or you may uh, want to keep all the time zone information, but avoid region names, just use the JMT offset, and so on. Uh, so uh, we are considering to add uh, possibilities for such flexibility. Uh, and uh, regarding the replication, uh, we are also uh, discussing an ability to move the customization, table label customization of the replication sets uh, from the configuration file to the uh, detail level. Also, you, you are defining uh, what you want to replicate and what you do not want to replicate with the detail statement. Uh, so these are the things we, will be, uh, we were considering, and uh, some of them are already done, but not yet committed. Uh, so you may expect these changes in the Fiber 4 code base. Uh, actually, as I said, uh, the current features were stable enough, and our original idea uh, to read beta 2 and then a relief candidate uh, could uh, not make much sense. We could actually go directly to the relief candidate stage. But uh, given uh, we have some features been revoked and uh, nobody tested yet these changes, uh, if all of these uh, things will be added in 5.4, uh, then maybe a uh, bit of two release will finally appear to, for you to be able to test uh, the new features report back. Because actually, it's written that, you know, it's what you actually consider a final release. You may disagree and report some part about that. Uh, yeah, this is looking for the private goal of the release candidate. Uh, but Still, uh, we are considering pretty much done. Uh, now, uh, as new, actually not not new features, but just some older uh, features are being a little bit reworked. Uh, may, we may need a 
a little bit more feedback from you. So Peter Chung would be uh, made released, uh, available this year, released soon. And after that, go to the release candidatization. Uh, but it should be pretty fast. But uh, no big delays, because uh, almost everything is already in place. Uh, now I will speak about uh, some features of Python 4 that uh, will not be covered, especially uh, by other sessions today, tomorrow. Uh, one of them is the new default data type, as I said. Uh, what it is, it actually uh, was initially implemented in uh, IBM DB2 database, and uh, then it uh, was become available as a part of the SQL specification. Uh, SQL, uh, actually three years ago, it was added to the SQL standard. Uh, so it's something maybe new. it looks new, but it's not really so because the uh, ANSI standard already included uh, storage details and uh, how uh, w what is actually deployed uh, the default data type uh, inside the standard uh, and uh, some hardware, mostly of course uh, made by IBM. Uh, but still, uh, all is supporting this new data files internally, a GCT compiler will support this and so on. So, it was a good idea for us to adapt new, new technology because what we had, pro what problems did we have with the uh, floating point numbers? You know, first of them, the precision is limited and the most problems, they are not exact. You cannot compare directly one equal to another. And uh, sometimes you get unexpected rounding errors, or just not errors, but the result becomes not the one you expect, and so on. So something better uh, is usually needed. Of course, we have a numeric data type which fits quite well, have precision up to uh, 18 digits, but that's again not enough. And the bigger problem is that uh, intermediate calculations with uh, long numeric data types cannot be performed with longer precision. The pivot operates with just 34 bit numbers and not more. If some, if some intermediate result cannot uh, fit that uh, storage, you get an error forward or so on. Uh, so, we just follow the standard and the DB2 database and uh, added support of the new data by the data type to the engine. It uh, just works as is, you may use just specify the code or specify with uh, explicit precision. Only two precision options are available, uh, 16 uh, digits or 34 digits. They correspond uh, respectively to 30, uh, 64 bits or 128 bits, of course. Why uh, you may need this, as I said, to uh, deal with really uh, big Floating uh, point values, but without uh, problems uh, that you may, you may have with double precision. What is really big, actually? How? What is the difference with big numeric, for example? Yes, uh, the storage is completely different. The decode data type again is load as double precision stores value base and exponent differently. And if you see it here, uh, 16 digits or 34 uh, digits. It doesn't mean that uh, you cannot store values bigger than uh, 34 decimal digits. It's just the internal storage of precision of exponent and base. Uh, the difference is that the exponent is not 2 base, but 10 base. And that actually the biggest uh, numbers available are 10 in the power of uh, 3,000 with something uh, for the longer data type. So actually really, really big numbers. Uh, this desktop is fully supported by the engine, the indexing, uh, sorting, and so on. All built-in functions support this new data type, so you just uh, may use it natively. Uh, if uh, shorter implementations of the database are used uh, in calculations, uh, the intermediate results are implicitly casted to the longer part with using a 34 decimal digits, and uh, then uh, the result is cast back in a string. Uh, the difference also is that uh, the decimal time is a little bit more flexible than the double precision and has some options to uh, control, to manage it, uh, its handling, and it has some additional functions to deal with that. You know that uh, 
with moving point values, so the, the specification declares some kind of special value, uh, not a number, in, in minus infinite, the plus infinite, and so on. And they are treated really specially by either delivering some unexpected result or throwing some error at trying time, and so on. But that code also supports all the values, but also provides uh, some functions how to deal with them properly without uh, getting unexpected errors and something like that. Uh, here is just the four of functions so we have added in Firebird 4 to uh, use to deal with uh, these features. Actually, uh, absolutely the same functions are supported in DB2, for example. So just uh, features of the deck load specification and deck load support. You may compare uh, deck load values without the comparison operator but the special function uh, that doesn't care about special values. But uh, another function, the last in this list, total order, compared again exactly with special. And uh, you can see uh, what is the rules of comparison of all the specials and the usual numbers. Uh, you can function normalize, normalize the result, remove failing zeros, you may uh, option to scale by the given pattern and so on just some flexibility for deal with the code numbers. Uh, and uh, also two uh, statements were added uh, to manage the code, uh, how uh, the deck load values are managed at the session level. Uh, set the code around mode, you can see the uh, possible options to control how the routing is performed, and the fact that the code traps too to set special traps for the, uh, some unexpected operations like the division by zero and so on to avoid uh, error and so on. Uh, and to handle also such things as overflow, underflow as defined, described by the standard. So you can uh, manage them uh, to, to the way you really uh, need. Getting back to the numeric data types, as I said, uh, we have offered longer numerics than beta one up to uh, 36 decimal, decimal digits in particular. Uh, but then, uh, now it's really replaced with the internal integer, uh, longer integer interpretation. Uh, so the actually the maximum precision is 38 uh, decimal digits now, backed by native uh, by the integer, 120, uh, 28 bits. Right now, the situation is actually is uh, looks like uh, quite good uh, first versions when we had uh, integer uh, data types of 64 bits, but it was not available at the skill level. It was used in maybe numeric uh, and decimal data types, but it was not available uh, directly. Uh, we have then introduced begin data types, which is actually part of the standard, so it was pretty much okay, and uh, it becomes available. Now we have even more, uh, even longer uh, data type, integer data type, and again, it's not uh, directly surface so far, uh, but we are considering this. The problem is that it will be a non-standard non extension, because uh, we have only two options. Introduce non-standard data type, or extend begin to become longer. But it's more, uh, it's better, it affects uh, backward compatibility and so on. It affects storage, it affects performance, so it uh, may cause some unexpected uh, problems. So we'd rather uh, not uh, extend begin, although the, the SQL standard allows that, because it doesn't really define what is the begin, 64 bits or longer, uh, but I don't think it's a really good idea. Uh, just if you wish to deal with uh, such long integer uh, numbers directly with special data type, not uh, numeric uh, 38, but uh, new data type, just please speak. Let me know, write to the tracker, write to the development list, and we will add uh, it as a non-standard data type, non-standard extension, but uh, it will be available to you if you need that. And uh, of course, uh, now all intermediate calculations performed using the maximal supported precision. What does it mean? As I said, for example, before that we had a uh, numeric uh, 18 as a maximum supported precision. Many of you have uh, exactly these declarations, numeric uh, 18 in the scale 2, maybe 3, maybe 4, and so on. But when you multiply them, uh, the engine of course, performs this calculation using again the same precision. 
the interesting part is that you know that numeric values are actually scaled to integers. So there could be many trailing zeros inside the value, but scale. And if intermediate calculation uh, actually exceeds the supported range of uh, 18 digits, but the trailing are actually zeros, so the result actually can be casted to the actual data type, but this inter intermediate storage is just not big enough to handle it. Now we get an overflow error. Also, actually the result could beat uh, the data type. Now all intermediate calculations will be performed with a longer precision, actually uh, such errors may be avoided. Depending on the expression when uh, these values are used, some uh, addition, division, multiplication, or some maybe aggregate functions, or something else, uh, these values, number values, may be internally counted to either maximum number of precision or maximum depth of precision, depending on what uh, what actually, uh, uh, how accurate uh, the, this uh, function uh, requires the result to be. Okay. Yes? Uh, one question. In 5.2.5 uh, count, for example, was it 32-bit uh, in 64-bit yeah. in 5.3? In yes. Would it also change again in 5.4? Well, not now. At least not now. Because it doesn't really make, for example, uh, well, I can imagine some query that uh, artificially produce more than... Uh, <laughs> from the .NET area, I had a lot of customers who had only a problem with this uh, area. Yes. Uh, why we did that? Just because uh, actually when we moved uh, to another ODS supporting more than uh, two uh, in the power 32 bits rows, uh, just count was not enough to deal with it in a single table. So we just had to increase it. Yeah. But uh, doing it twice, I don't see any sense right now. I, I believe the uh, count will remain uh, 64 bits yeah. so far. And, and perhaps as an idea, uh, you talked about the uh, flexible data type binding. Yes. It could be also an option for the future for this kind of... Uh, uh, possibly, if you think it will be needed, we will have support for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another new, uh, actually very big feature, big for us, because it requires quite a lot of reports to support, is the time zone support. Uh, it actually consists of multiple parts. Uh, first of all, we've introduced again a new data type, uh, time uh, with time zone, time without time zone, and time stamp, of course, with time zone, without time zone. Without time zone is actually what you are used to uh, deal with, fi with fiber. Uh, so the same absolutely 64-bit uh, uh, number for timestamp or 32-bit uh, number for time, uh, where the time zone is implicit. You do, it's not stored, you just uh, suppose it's usually the time zone of the server. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not reinforced in any way. New data type with time zone, it's a new data type. Uh, which also supports the time zone displacement. It actually could be defined differently. Uh, we are there actually always on minus displacement uh, from the GMT time, or we have the predefined uh, region names. The list of the region names is uh, quite fixed uh, and available in the we have a special package in Firebird. Or you can, and uh, of course, you know that the problem is that the rules tend to change. And it may affect future rules and the past rules. So the table of matching uh, region names to uh, displacements is quite flexible with time. So changes and uh, we need to deal with these changes too. Uh, so, uh, but you, you may use this feature. Uh, how it's stored internally, actually we convert Whatever the, you, the way, whatever the way you define uh, your timestamp, it's being converted and template to the UTC, but the time zone information is still stored as you entered it. It's not casted to anything, it's just not converted, so we preserve the original information. So if you select from that table, uh, you may get all the rows, getting different region names and so on. If, if it was, this was the way uh, you were entering this data. Uh, why it was why it stored, uh, stored internally at UTC? Just to simplify the storage, uh, the sorting, the indexing, and so on, to make the keys uh, comparable. But it's not on the client side. Uh, we have also introduced uh, the new standard extension at, actually, it's an expression that translates uh, the given 
time or time uh, value to the uh, given uh, time zone, another time zone, because you know you you have cast to change the data type, but you cannot use the cast to change the the region or time zone. It's not a part of the standard. So the standard defines new uh, expression for that, and you can see our uh, example here. Of course, we have a struct function now it supports also uh, time zone hours and time zone minutes to get the displacement. Uh, but the bigger change that may really affect compatibility that you should uh, be aware about is that current time and current time stamp functions existing since the fire very far at the beginning now return UTC values, not the local time stamps as before. Uh, why? Because this is a requirement of the SQL specification. We were not compliant so far, but we didn't have a time zone support so far. So now to be really uh, compliant and to implement this feature in the logical way, we had to change that. Uh, the SQL specification suggests alternative functions called local time and local time stamp to return exactly the same uh, time stamps as before uh, local time stamps. So actually if you really uh, need to uh, get local time, you should change your current time, current time stamp functions to the local time and local time stamp. To simplify you, uh, the migration process to 5.4, uh, functions local time and local time stamp were also added to 5.3 and 5.2.5. So you have a lot of time actually to use them in your current databases without migration change your code to use a new function and only then uh, migrate to 5.4 and, don't, and you, you will not have any problems with that. Uh, but pay attention. Uh, actually, it's not a really big problem because uh, casting between uh, time, uh, time step with time zone and without time zone can be done implicitly by the engine. So if you use uh, these functions inside the stored procedures, for example, and return some uh, store some uh, the result as type or time stamp time, data type without time zone, uh, it will be just casted to the local time time or local time, and you will not uh, notice any problems at all. But if you run queries containing current time, current time time from the client side, you will be getting different times than before. So actually, first sh what you should check is what uh, your client application uh, does with these functions. Do you really need them? Do you use them? And if so, you should uh, replace them with local time stuff. Of course, to simplify uh, how to work with the new, uh, this new feature with time zones, so we provide an option to uh, specify some default time zone. It could be specified as fiber.com file, can be used as a, be used as a kind of uh, global default applied to all client sessions. But uh, also you can override this default as a connection level by specifying it usually using the special CPB tag during the connection time. And also you may change uh, your current local time zone by using by running uh, this set statement. You may you may uh, change the current time zone at runtime and you can restore it back using the set time uh, zone local. You can reset it to the original value. Now, the most interesting part, but we don't have much time, but anyway, uh, what about the future? What are the, our plans? Just uh, let's start with your wishes. So far, getting feedback from different conferences and uh, hearing some uh, feedback from our users, we see uh, that, first of all, uh, we need to uh, get some publicity. Uh, we need to release, make releases uh, regularly to just uh, make everyone happy to see that everyone sees that the record is progressing, that it's not stalled, and so on. Uh, so it's really important, and not only from the marketing point of view, but also for developers to understand what's going on uh, and what to expect and so on. However, we, the practice shows that we deliver big versions once per two, three, four years. Sometimes more now, it was just bad timing. It's not really, it, was, it wasn't really expected. Uh, but usually two, three, four years. Uh, and every new uh, 
Korea introduced a lot of new features, new OTS version, and uh, quite a number of uh, backward compatibility issues with new data types, with uh, quer queries working a little bit different, for new parsing rules for queries, and so on. Some stricter rules applied, and so on. So, we have two problems with uh, upgrading to the big fiber uh, releases. First of them, if you have a really big uh, database, then you are really not in a good position to upgrade often, because it takes uh, quite a lot of time to back up and restore. It may be the downtime may be big enough for your business to do it uh, really often. And also, some incompatibilities may exist that require serious testing, so you cannot uh, really just back up, restore, and go on. You need to validate that your queries will be working fine with the new version and so on. So it really uh, become, may become annoying if you do it really often yearly or faster. Uh, so actually, uh, we have some conflicting points here. So uh, release often, or it may be a good thing, but upgrade often, it's not a good thing. Uh, so, what problems we have with that? Uh, besides the uh, quite uh, contradictory the user demands, we also, you know, the team is quite small, we are doing what we can, uh, but uh, we don't uh, have much more developers than before. Uh, the code base is aging, it's not really bad, but uh, to implement some new features it requires just uh, aggressive refactoring. It also takes time. And so far we were always choosing the feature-based uh, release management. So we cannot release before we deliver all the features we promised. I'm promising them regularly, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, so, how to deal with these problems? Actually, all these problems uh, just leave one single result. We simply cannot release more often than uh, two or three years uh, between releases. Because many features, with many changes, uh, and uh, we need that the five dot uh, drivers, uh, JBO or the .NET provider and so on, they need to catch up to support the new features too. It also takes time and so on. Uh, so, this is the kind of problem. So, what we can suggest in this regard? We were thinking and uh, discussing this and uh, wanted to just uh, switch from the feature based schedule to the time based <coughs> schedule and provide smaller releases, but a little bo uh, more often. What can be uh, the problem with that? Is that, well, again, we get to the problem of often upgrading. It's uh, maybe a really big problem for many of you. Uh, so, the idea is that we release more often smaller things that doesn't require uh, you any, uh, it doesn't give you any problems with upgrading. Now, uh, and I will show how. Uh, Actually, one of the ideas discussed uh, is uh, they adopt uh, the Intel's uh, TikTok idea. You know that they uh, change, uh, release new CPU versions uh, in different uh, ways. They just get, uh, do the architectural change, the, then they get the technological uh, step. And again, uh, but we not really should uh, take the same idea, but it could be adopted. Uh, why? Uh, because to separate actually big development and small development, uh, you know that 5.3.0 point releases not get, get not only bug fixes but uh, some improvements. Actually, nothing prevents uh, us from backporting some small features the same way, but just calling it not the point release but some minor release. It's the same old deal. You don't have to become restore, but it contains features. Uh, we make some publicity, uh, and the big uh, version still being developed in the background. It's not really about parallel development, no. It's about backporting features from the big version to a smaller version. Uh, we did that for very minor things, but it could be really done for some uh, bigger features as well. But some features may be not really hard, not to implement, uh, may be not really big, but uh, they require a minor ODS change. Uh, what is a minor ODS change? It's actually a change in the system table. If we add one more field to existing system table, 
or at one more system table is actually uh, we have to bump the mean or ODS number of the database. Uh, so, how to deal with that? It's simple. Small my minor release with just three or four new features, good enough, but it introduces new inner ODS. And what you have to do? You have to pick up restore. We're getting the same problem again. Uh, so another option that we are considering is to simplify the upgrade part, especially uh, make it possible to upgrade uh, to the MINAR ODS version below the Uh And uh, I will explain it a little bit later. Uh, for major leads, we have plenty of time, again, two or three years. We, we may uh, do major ODS, ODS changes. Of course, it will be an incompatible uh, database and backup restore will be required. It will uh, contain uh, some big uh, unique features that we cannot be backported easily, so it will be just bound to this major release. Uh, but uh, it may also create uh, some basement, internal basement that other features may follow. It can be done uh, quite easily on that background. Uh, we are trying to minimize the incompatibilities, but we still allow them for major releases. They are possible. Of course, they will be documented, some workarounds will be published, but still they are available. But again, uh, we are keeping actually uh, the existing uh, timing. So they are really not often. So you don't have, uh, uh, you're not going to have problems very often. And you decide whether to uh, go to that release with all the possible problems or just keep it and you wait for another one. At the same time, some features that are possible to implement uh, with the current ODS can be easily backported to the previous versions. Uh, including minor ODS changes. As I said, uh, we are suggesting a new upgrade option so that uh, you can switch to a new uh, minor ODS without backup restore. Uh, and uh, we are promising that except a few new features and improvements, uh, these minor releases will not uh, provide any uh, backward compatibility problem. Again, there code is quite stable, features uh, number is small, so we may expect that uh, alpha and beta testing will not be required. We could uh, just do some milestone release for you to review the new features. We could go directly to the release and the stage, there are different options possible. But anyway, uh, this uh, approach allows us to release these small uh, versions faster. Uh, maybe once per year is the more, most desirable, uh, but uh, maybe a little bit uh, Fast or slower. Uh, and about the minor ODS management, uh, as I said, this is just an example. The key point here is that uh, we replace the backup restore requirement with the JFIX upgrade command. So it actually does your database, checks it, and adds the, the missing fields on system tables, add new system tables, and so on. Uh, some of you may remember that actually such a uh, way of upgrading the ODS existed in the early part of session. But it was done automatically when you first connect to the older database with the new fiber version. Uh, I don't really like that approach uh, because it really uh, works uh, without your control and uh, it may not really desire for you to switch to the new minor ODS version. Uh, so we have disabled it in the code and it's not used in recent fiber releases. But we can re-enable it with explicit command to upgrade your database. You just upgrade to the new fiber version and see whether any of the new features that are bound to the new MENA ODS version are needed for you. If not, you are just running the new fiber version without any upgrade at all. If you think you need it, you just run JTX upgrade, get all the features of the new MENA ODS version, and again, you have no downtime, you have no uh, problems with test testing and so on. The only uh, problem here, not really a problem, but uh, it's actually expected, but anyway, uh, if you just uh, found uh, yourself some problems and you want to downgrade, uh, it's again only backup restore is an option. Uh, this is just the idea we wanted to present you and hear your feedback, whether you will be satisfied with such an approach or not. Actually, what I'm talking right now, it's not just uh, some promises settled in stone, it's uh, something we as a team, we want to discuss with you as our customers. We really need the feedback from your side, what you consider a good idea, what it's not. Because, uh, well, we have three days here, 
with many sessions, many beers, and so on. Uh, we will have a round table at the end of this day, and uh, as far as I remember, the last day too, uh, to share your opinion about different sessions. So you may speak there, you may uh, write our emails, you may uh, write to the survivor development uh, list, and uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, share your what, what you think about this. Uh, just an example, if we choose uh, one year interval between mean releases and two years between measure majorly it could look this way. Again, it's not a promise, it's just how it's going to work. Uh, the key, again, is just a time-based schedule. We develop features for the major release, and after one year, we just check how many of them are backportable without problem. We do that and release. We do that and release. The bigger development still continues. Uh, not big problems for us, it's really doable, uh, and uh, we hope that the, this idea uh, will be uh, comfortable for you to get uh, upgrades without problems, and uh, more often, if you really need that, of course. Nobody forces you to upgrade regularly or faster and so on. Uh, what other reasons behind this? Uh, Usually, a uh, new fiber, big fiber release, we are speaking about fiber 5 here, for example, introduced new ideas and a lot of new features. Fiber 4 has introduced, for example, replication. But replication is really not a single feature. It's just an architecture and uh, it's a platform that can evolve with multiple years to get better and better and better. Uh, this slide just demonstrates uh, what possible improvements may uh, the replication get <coughs> in the next few years. And they are not, absolutely not bound to any other features, to the new oldest version and so on. They can be just uh, evolved from what we have now, using it as a basement. So, of course, it doesn't make sense to delay all these things for many years until the major release. They could, they could be done uh, faster. Also, we have uh, some features that are in the, pro uh, in the progress, or maybe uh, already ready, but are still not reviewed or not finalized. One of them is a trunk table statement, for example. Uh, we have a patch, but it's not really ported to the Firebird 4 port base. Uh, so, if they will not come uh, to the Firebird 4 release in time, we will not delay Firebird 4, they will just go to the uh, next uh, mini version. Uh, you know that uh, we also have some advanced fiber-based distributions like, uh, like Red, Data, Red Database, uh, Valerian, uh, HQ Work, and so on. No, actually, not so on. Uh, these three are the only ones. At least, uh, no. Of course, uh, they uh, provide some unique features. Uh, I, by unique, I mean uh, special for these particular distributions because uh, they need to some, uh, how make money uh, based on fiber and so on. They need to sell something. Uh, but we have an agreement with all these companies that all the unique changes they do, they contribute back to the project. Uh, they just use some small gap uh, that when these features are quite unique to this particular product, then uh, this code is contributed back and merged inside the base, uh, the private code base. Uh, the question is when. It depends on this particular feature. Uh, if it's not bound to some major ODS uh, change, uh, it can be uh, backported earlier. Uh, of course, uh, we will have sessions about HQBird, we will have sessions about RAID database, so you will uh, see what uh, differences they offer as compared to the base fiber, plain fiber distribution. Uh, but uh, all these features are actually uh, backportable, and uh, we have an agreement to do that. So they will not come in fiber 4, but they may easily come in fiber whatever, one, five, whatever we call it, the next point releases, uh, not point releases, the next ma mean releases of the fiber 4 are serious. Of course, we have uh, usually, uh, we're trying to improve the engine regarding scalability, optimizer, and so on, all these improvements, including uh, extended uh, support for monitoring, uh, extended tracing support, and so on. All these improvements will be also uh, done uh, in all code bases, uh, just because, uh, well, it's about uh, your performance and about uh, management of your databases. It's a really important, uh, vitally important thing that uh, we should not delay um, longer than uh, really necessary. 
And that you both about private flying. It's not really, uh, we, we don't really have uh, a feature list uh, ready for publishing yet. I will just <coughs> explain uh, what's going on now. Uh, private uh, far so far we are considering the next, the next big version with a new uh, major ODS. Uh, what features it's going to contain? Actually, it much uh -huh. depends on you. Uh, here is uh, just top 10 uh, tickets by, uh, ordered by the goals uh, from our uh, path tracker. You know that the path tracker uh, have a voting feature, so you may uh, vote for the features you most like. This is just the top 10 of them. So far, we are considering that you really need these features. What's going to be next? Next, uh, we combine them, uh, we choose just some of them, and combine them with their core changes inside the engine that are not really vis visible for you, that, uh, but they may allow us to implement new features, new improvements, and so on. Uh, just uh, a few examples what could happen in the new ODF. Uh, that, uh, we are quite close to get them implemented, uh, and uh, they may allow some, uh, again, not only better performance, but uh, some, uh, remove some limitations, improve some things, and so on. Combined the internal core changes with uh, a number of the features from the bug tracker, the most voted features, we go to the technical task group. Technical task group is actually a part of the Firebird project, uh, and uh, it consists of support developers, product administrators, and uh, private sponsors. As I said, in the beginning, how you can affect uh, this uh, private planning. First, you may vote on the features in the tracker. Second, you, can, uh, you may become a sponsor and uh, be directly involved in the decision making. Every sponsor has uh, votes to uh, use on particular features. <coughs> so, I, for example, check that list that list, and go to the technical task group with, uh, for example, five or six items combined from these combined groups. Uh, and uh, other technical uh, task group members vote what from this list they want to get. We just then uh, summarize the roles and uh, decide what will be implemented in private file. Uh, again, this is just top 10 from the tracker. It's not uh, the features we are promising for 5 by 5, but we will make up picture in them and voting. And uh, the result of the voting will actually uh, make their final feature list. They, go, they will go to the planning board, but as I said, we are switching from the feature based uh, management, management to time based. So, this is just tasks. And we have a time frame. Whatever uh, of these tasks, the task, how many of these tasks will be done in time, they will come into release. Others will go uh, to another one. So it's not a direct promise, it's just our intentions. But uh, to avoid any uh, delayed releases, uh, we are just uh, doing what we can in time and release. This, that's the idea. Actually, I'm out of time already, but uh, my slides are already over. So if you have. Uh, some questions right now, please. If not, uh, you may ask after my second uh, session. There will be a coffee break, or we will have a round table to discuss the things and so on.